right. Welcome to the second in a series of live webinars uh, sponsored by the Reflexology Association of California. The title of this series is Holistic Healing with Reflexology. If you were with us last week, we discussed the basic practicality and an introduction to reflexology for the general public and some of the case histories that we've had. My name is Dr. Arundel Spindalelis. I'm a traditional naturopath, a certified nutritionist, and a certified reflexologist. I am the sole health care provider at uh, Tree of Life Holistic Wellness Center. That is the only naturopathic primary medical center in Northern California. We currently have over a thousand patients from around the world. We pretty much treat about anything you can think of we treat at the clinic. Our main emphasis is on chronic disorders like Lyme disease, cancer, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, and, and uh, Crohn's disease. You pretty much name it within the chronic areas we do treat that. While we have a large number of uh, modalities that we work with, we also uh, work like, for example, herbs and, and holistic medications and things of nature. One of the, my favorite modalities is reflexology. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to talk this time. We're going to be talking about uh, practical applications of reflexology and how we have treated patients. And this is meant more on a level of those that are familiar with reflexology and how we were able to practically apply it in our protocols. So we're going to get started on that uh, today. All right. So as I said, we are a primary medical center. This is a wonderful e example of reflexology being used in a clinical application. For those watching these videos, I'm sure that most of you have some familiarity with reflexology. And for reflexologists today, we know that one of our primary hurdles is getting past the education part where the general public is, is not well informed on the, the protocol for reflexology, the modality and what it is capable of doing. Unfortunately, it still is kind of put into the new age metaphysical line and, and most people don't realize that this has actually been around since the first incident that we know of was around 2300 BC, where it was actually seen on the wall of an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian temple. So obviously this has been around a lot longer than modern medicine has, and it is tried and true and has been used very successfully. So in our clinic, we actually have clinical evidence, clinical application that reflexology does indeed work. And the good news is, is that even within the, the conventional medical field, <clears throat> it is slowly being accepted. For example, it was probably only 20, 30 years ago that the conventional industry medical industry did not accept even massage therapy, that that was airy foo foo that what could rubbing somebody do in a medical application. Now, of course, chiropractics and massage therapy are all well accepted protocols. Reflexology is now rapidly catching up thanks to organizations like the Reflexology Association of California. All right. So what we're going to discuss is practical applications and more or less a bit of a how-to uh, with actual case studies of what we did within the clinic for a, a set of particular patients. So this, again, this is meant more for those that might have a little bit more knowledge of reflexology. Um, so we'll go from there. All right, as I said, <clears throat> reflexology within our clinic is just one of many modalities that we, we use. We work, because it's naturopathic medicine, obviously we work a lot with holistic medicines such as herbs, uh, vitamin, mineral therapy, things of that nature. We also, though, work with extensively with diet and nutrition, uh, as well as fresh air, exercise, uh, lifestyle choices and, and changes in our patients. We actually are a pretty strict clinic about that. We insist that our patients who agree to become in our system to change their diets, to, to come in for monthly appointments, and to um, take their medications on a regular basis. All right, so like herbs, like fresh air, like sunshine, like massage therapy, um, like any form of medication, on their own, they generally, they are better if they are used in conjunction with other modalities. And reflexology is no exception. Reflexology used by itself can be very good 
in acute situations. I, I just hurt myself, you know, uh, minor, or I have a cold, um, or, or something like that. Reflexology actually, all by its little own self, used correctly, can actually help you get through a cold faster, can help you heal faster from basic injuries and things like that. But for long-term chronic issues, which is one of the biggest things that's going on in today's medical field, more and more MDs, for example, are getting upset. Okay, all naturopaths, all MDs, we all have to go through med school. All right, one thing that MDs are starting to get upset about is that they come out of med school realizing that they don't have a lot of training in, in chronic diseases. They, and this is no, not meant to be degrading to anyone. There is a place for MDs, NDs, chiropractors. We all have places in the industry. MDs are wonderful at emergency medicine. Absolutely amazing. But a lot of them are coming out of school now complaining, saying they weren't really taught anything about how to cure chronic disease. The basic treatment for chronic disease in the United States is write a prescription for a drug, basically to band-aid the issue. All right. One of the things that we find is more important is holistic healing says, let's get to the root cause. Let's treat it so that the chronic disease goes away. So it's kind of exciting to see that more and more MDs are going into practice and finding out that they didn't learn everything they needed. And they're actually beginning to take courses in naturopathic medicine. In other words, more MDs are becoming more open-minded to holistic medicine. In other words, holistic meaning the whole body. We don't just treat the thyroid. The thyroid didn't get out by itself. It had to have something else that, that caused it to get out of balance. So that's the whole thing behind holistic medicine is to get the body back in balance. Okay, and reflexology is a wonderful tool for this. And when it comes to chronic diseases, the, the type we're gonna be talking about today, it, like many other things, is best used in conjunction with others. So the exciting thing is, is that reflexology can be used. In, con in conjunction with conventional medicine as well as complementary. So let's talk about a few cases here and uh, a couple of them I actually talked about last time but we're going to go into a little bit more detail how these patients were able to find cures. All right, <clears throat> first patient we're going to talk about today is again, I spoke about her last time, is my wife Peggy. Uh, if you watch the previous episode of the series you will remember that she had long-term chronic hip issues, or at least what we thought were hip issues. There was significant chronic pain in her hips, and she tried going to a massage therapist for quite a number of months, tried to do things like that, and while she did get improvement, it never did heal. And so finally one day I said, will you let me do some reflexology on you? Because as I mentioned previously, reflexology is a great diagnostic tool. Now I know that Reflexology is not a substitute for medical treatment in that reflexologists are not allowed to diagnose. Okay, but in conjunction with other therapies, you can either have another doctor do it or a doctor can do reflexology now. Um, it can, in those, those cases, be used diagnostically. In my case, I was able to do that. I <clears throat> took my wife and I started doing reflexology on her foot. In this case, it was purely for diagnostic purposes. What's really going on with her hips? Just because you have pain, in such, such an area of your body, does not mean that that area of the body is the part, of the, the part of the problem. One of the things you learn, especially in the medical field, is something called referral pain. You may actually have something wrong somewhere entirely different, but the pain shows up somewhere else. All right, so that's one of the common things you learn in med school is something called the Chapman reflex. All right, reflex points, where you, there's certain points on the body you can press that appear to have nothing to do with what you think you're gonna be doing, but they actually can show that there's another problem. For example, um, there is a point about an inch below your breastbone, okay, below the xiphoid, and slightly over to the left against your rib cage. If you press there, and this is an actual medical fact, if you press there and it's tender and it hurts, then very likely, you have a stomach acid problem. So your nerves are set up in the body in such a way, and the feet are wonderful mirrors of this, that while there may be a problem somewhere else, it actually causes pain in a totally different area. So with my wife, Peggy, I started working on her feet, and without telling her, as I worked my way through, I went to the reflex points, and for most people that know this with reflexology, it's on the inner and outer uh, ankle bones in that area. 
I started working on those without telling her where I was at. I didn't want, my general rule of thumb is, and I imagine most of you see this, when you're working on a patient for the first time with reflexology, you don't initially tell them what zone you're in what body system you're working on when you're pressing on their feet. Because very often the patient will, you'll tell them to go, okay, I'm getting ready to work on your hips. Oh yeah, yeah, I have problems down there. What you wanna do is you wanna work on those zones without telling them what it is. For example, my protocol is on a patient's first visit, I have a chart out so I can record everything that I'm about to do. And I say, okay, I'm gonna start working on your feet. First we do some relaxation. And then I say, okay, I'm getting ready to start. And I start working on each and every zone. We cover all the zones on the feet. And I go, I'm not going to tell you where I'm at, what the zone is, but I would like you that when you feel something more than just pressure, a sensation or a numbness, or it hurts or it burns or it tingles, when it's not just pressure, tell me. I will record where it's at, and I will at that moment say, I am at so-and-so. I'm at your heart. I'm at your stomach. And then they can respond. Sometimes they go, nope, nothing's wrong there. But very, very often they'll go, yes, I have a problem there. Okay, and so that's okay. That's great. It's a nice affirmation. All right, well, in Peggy's case, I worked on, the, on the, both the inner and outer ankle bones for the inner and outer hips on both, both left and right feet. She didn't respond at all. No pain, no discomfort. Well, that tells me right there, the issue she's having is not in that locale. It is actually not her hips. All right, so I didn't tell her what I was doing. I just continued on. I didn't want to lead, lead her on in anything. So I went on, and then I got to her spine. The, this on the, the normal routine on the, the reflexology is it's, it's on the, uh, the inside of the foot where the side of the foot and the bottom of the foot basically come together. It's that little arch area that comes down. That's the entire length of the spine. She did respond in the thoracic or around the middle of the spine. She responded there. I was like, all right, okay. Then I went on and I hit part of the uh, upper back muscles, which in normal cases is at the top of the foot. All right, she almost came up off the bed. I was like, all right. Because she, I go, is there any problems with your back? No, no problems, but boy, that really hurts. And I go, all right, it's not your hips. The reflexology is saying it's your back. So what we did was then had her turn over and I went to those locations that the foot itself showed, which according to reflexology was the thoracic area of her back and near the upper back muscles. And I found that location and I went straight to it and hit it and she almost came up off the floor. When I did that, it, the pain was so strong. I said, gotcha. Okay, so what's been going on is she actually had a back muscle issue uh, in her middle of her back, the thoracic part of her back, which referred down to her hips, which is very, very common. One of the most common things I find in this country, and it's going to affect the way you do reflexology, is that almost all humans are side biased. They're either left-handed, right-handed, left-footed, right-footed. Almost all humans are side biased, which is going to cause you to have one side of the body tighter than the other. It's just the way it is. And so whenever I'm working with patients, I can almost without fail, one side will be tighter than the other. All right. And this is one of the issues with chiropractics. When I talk to patients about that, the one thing a good chiropractor is going to be one that tells you that the only way to hold the adjustment is to fix the overlaying muscles. And so they'll pop you back in or they'll manipulate you back in. But a good chiropractor will also inform you of how to fix the overlaying muscles because they're the ones that keep you in balance. And so what happened with her back was um, it, it was the back muscles were tight. It was causing pain, which was also affecting her hips, but more on a level of pain, nothing actual organic was there was more referral. So by using reflexology, we worked on her feet every week. We worked on her back every week. And in a much shorter period of time, it completely disappeared and all of it went away. All of a sudden, this long-standing hip issue had gone away because she'd been treated for hips when it really should have been the middle of her back. So that's a great example of how the reflexology was able to find a point and treat it all at the same time. Our general recommendation for treatments with reflexology, and I have patients ask this a lot, I always try to be aware of people's money issues because unfortunately, it, while it is better that insurance companies are beginning to cover this cost more and more, a lot still don't. And in areas like where we're at in Redding, California, 
Um, there's a whole lot of very low income families without insurance or their insurance has such an incredibly high deductible, you might as well not have insurance except for catastrophic accidents. So I'm always trying to be aware that I don't like overcharging patients and I don't want them getting medical care. That is unwarranted. So, but they will still ask me, they go, okay, wow, that was great. That was wonderful. It helped immensely. How often should I come back? And I go, okay, look, I'm not trying to be a salesman, but the general rule of thumb is in anything chronic, you should come back at least once a week for at least a month, a month and a half. We evaluate, and if you're doing better, which most are, then we can go out to every two to four weeks, and then we do that for a few months. And the general rule of thumb in chronic issues, we generally like to see them once a week for about a month. And they, and they understand. They're not acting like, oh, I'm trying to, add, I'm trying to get money out of them. Because I give them the option. Like, uh, I had a patient yesterday with this exact same type of situation. She said, when should I come back? I said, well, it's up to you. I said, I recommend every week for at least a month. But if you need to stretch it out every two weeks, that's okay. You know, you're still going to get benefit out of it. Because what I try to do is I try to tell patients, here are things you can do at home. There are things that you can actually tell patients, here, here's a zone on your foot. Work on this. You can just, and you can do that on your own, and you know where they're not going to hurt themselves, and you know the situations like that. So I tell patients, well, it's important to come to your healthcare provider, your reflexologist and such. It's good to back up what you're doing at home so that it makes the treatments more effective. All right. So that was my wife. All right. Here was another interesting case. Um, he uh, we was a patient for quite some time, had uh, some very serious issues. He was my first schizophrenic patient that I've ever had. Most people don't realize that the most, the, the most diagnosed mental disorder in the United States is actually schizophrenia. You'd think it wouldn't be, but the most diagnosed psychotic or those type of issues in the United States is schizophrenia. And he had extreme schizophrenia. He was on lithium and Wellbutrin. He was on some very, very nasty antipsychotic drugs, neuroleptic drugs, and they were causing him to have dyskinia. He was having a lot of muscle tremors. The drugs themselves were causing this. He had basically become a, a zombie. All right, well, his situation was, when he was a child, he was molested as a little boy. All right, and, he did, and here he is. By the time he came to me, he was in his 50s, and he just never got over it. He'd been on these drugs for years. His wife brought him in. Is there anything that we can do? So we have a nice holistic protocol, holistic medications and dietary recommendations that we put patients on for these types of disorders, and he started to improve. It was nice. It was great to see improvement happening. He was, he was, he was improving. All right. But I said, you know, after a few weeks of this and he was, there was some improvement, I said, you know what I'd like to do is I would like to, and I even offered, I said, the first one let's do for free because I'd like to see how he responds. And so I said, let's do a no charge reflexology appointment just to see how he responds to this. And of course they were happy they were excited to do that. And so they came in and she sat with them during the first appointment. And again, the first one's diagnostic I'm going through. And what I found was interesting where his key points were. His key points in this case for a reflexologist were the brain, which is around the big toe, top of the big toe. His brain reflex hurt, hurt a lot. He actually tensed up quite a bit and almost came up off the table. It, it hurt incredibly. It's like, okay, that makes sense. Also in the same area, you got the pituitary, the pineal, the hypo, you know, uh, hypothalamus, all of those. They all reacted. They all were quite painful to him. Um, went on a little bit further, and of course, his adrenals showed up. His adrenals were quite painful. All right, so this all made a lot of sense, that this was a lot of stress-induced, the, the brain. No wonder the brain hurts so much. After being on these antipsychotic drugs for so many years, his brain chemistry had been altered. Uh, it was not in a normal state anymore. His liver uh, uh, reflex point showed up. His liver was also sensitive. So it's like, okay, everything made sense. So I recommended that we do a regular, and he did. He came in once a week, and actually I think he did it for about two months. Once a week he came in, and the standard protocol is you do a, one treatment, you find out where the issues are, you record them on paper, and then they continue to come back. 
Now, when they come back, my belief is because holistic means whole body, well being in balance. Always, when you do reflexology, do all zones. Even if those zones aren't a problem, do them all. But what you do is, you now know that there are trouble zones. When you get to those, you stay on those longer. You give them more treatment than you would say, okay, the colon's fine, I'll hit it because I want everything in balance. But I'm not gonna stay on the colon, I'm gonna move on to the brain. I'm gonna move on the pituitary and the adrenals. So you do everything but you focus mainly, most of your time is spent on the, on the hot spots, on the parts that are painful. So we did this. He was an exciting, exciting case. Um, as the weeks went by, and this is what you look for, as the weeks go by, the pain on those hot spots get less and less and less. They, they get to where they don't hurt as much. Um, I had a patient come in one time and she had been to a reflexologist years ago. She was scared to death of me. She said the last reflexologist I went to, she said it hurt so bad she couldn't keep coming back. And I said, well, there is a point to reflexology. It is going to be painful, but the reflexologist has to know, never go beyond what the patient is capable of. You do what they're capable of, and you go from there. So my routine is, yes, it's going to hurt some, but it's tolerable. You're not going to be screaming into the night. You're going to work on the patient for a little bit. You're going to try to... And, as the weeks go by, this is what's exciting. As the weeks go by, the pain gets less, but I get harder on them. And, and then about three or four weeks later, they're going, well, this doesn't hurt much. And I go, yeah, that's interesting, because I'm bearing down a lot harder than I did four weeks ago. And they go, oh, they get really excited about it, knowing, oh, not only are you, it's not hurting, but you're actually being harder on me. Which, and I say, that means the system has been stimulated so much that it is, it is reacting, it's beginning to heal. The balance is coming in. So that was exciting. So his started to where they weren't um, hurting anywhere near as much. And yet I was basically working on him uh, more and more uh, as far as um, uh, being harder on his feet. All right. Other good things really came about from this, uh, you know, as it was going on. Um, as we continued with the treatment, his other doctor, because he had a psychiatrist that was working with him, the other psychiatrist noticed that um, his patient was reacting better. His patient wasn't having as many deep, dark times. He wasn't having a lot of the symptoms that we see from schizophrenia. And so literally within two months, his, I think it was between a month and two months, the dosages that he was on, was down to half of what it used to be. While he was recovering well, giving him the holistic medications for treating schizophrenia, and we were using orthomolecular treatments on him, which was vitamin and mineral therapy, the reflexology caused such a change in the system that he was able to, his other doctor, got him down to half of the doses that he used to be on. Eventually, he actually started peeling him off the drugs entirely. So that was very exciting. Now, there were two things that happened in the process of all this, which is pretty exciting. About five weeks into it, his, his wife came to me, and she said, I just want to let you know something. For the first time in five years, she said, he has started to laugh. He has started to laugh out loud. And I noticed that I could actually make jokes with him. Um, but uh, he... Um, he, and he when at first, because I'm a very joking kind of person. I like to joke. I think humor is a big part of reflexology or part of healing in general. Okay. But uh, uh, just so that somebody knows there's somebody that's doing a lot of moving and papers and things like that, and it's actually coming across on the recording, if oh, we can kind of keep, that's okay. I'm just kind of keep. Sorry. No. That's me. <laughs> Not a problem. Just letting you know it's coming across. <clears throat> okay. So, I would, I like to bring humor in with our practice. And at first he just, during the first month or so of his sessions, he was just very quiet. You know, he would just lay there and eventually he got to smile. And eventually I would get a chuckle out of him. And so after about five weeks, his wife said, he's actually laughing out loud. So that was exciting. Okay. <laughs> Last part of this story. 
about three more weeks goes by and his wife comes in with a beaming smile <laughs> and they were obviously very comfortable with me she was in there by herself one time just came in to pick up his other meds <laughs> and she said I have to tell you something else and she he, he said I said yes she said for the first time in about three years he wants to have sex <laughs> So it was nice to see that things were beginning to improve even on a family level and they were, things were becoming normalized again within their family as far as they were concerned. So this was a case with reflexology as a major component in a psychiatric case used in conjunction with conventional therapy medicine. He had uh, lithium, Wellbutrin, but he also had the holistic medications from our clinic. They worked extremely well together but we watched how reflexology actually really turned the tables and caused the changes, the improvement to happen at a much faster rate. All right, so that was that patient. All right, we have another patient, a uh, 90-year-old lady. I, I think I spoke about her in the last uh, uh, episode as well. Um, 90 years old, serious scoliosis, um, a, uh, a thyroid, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, a lot of issues were with her. She was a, a pretty bitter lady because she had lived most of her life with, with these conditions. And so, and her scoliosis because of a very poor diet, basically sad, the standard American diet, which means she was at a very significant issue with calcium absorption because of today's diet. The scoliosis only got worse as the years went by, which she became more bitter as the years went. So years and years of this poor diet, years and years of continual pain and discomfort, about the only re release she ever got was going to a chiropractor and eventually that chiropractor, I think, moved away. And so the only relief that she ever got left, right? Then they brought her in to me and we tried our best and she did some things, but we tried to get her to change her diet and she did improve it somewhat. We got on her on some holistic medications that would improve her calcium and her pain and things of that nature. But one of the biggest complaints that she had and her family had is that, and you, it was her cognitive abilities were beginning to go down. There, she was beginning to have problems in that area. All right, and you go, well, she's 90 years old. Of course, so that's not true. There is no expiration tag on the bottom of your foot. There's nothing there that says you have to become this way over time. Okay, there is no such thing as an incurable disease, only incurable people, as stated by Dr. Christopher. All right, so they brought her in. We, were, we started her on those, and there was some improvement. Her thyroid started improving, and things got better. But again, not as fast as we would have liked. So she agreed because she was already used to physical therapy, like in the vein of chiropractics, the family wanted her to try reflexology. So we tried it. And <laughs> I mean, 90 years old, and she was a, a bit of a bitter, bitter person. She complained about the pain and discomfort, you know, with the reflexology. Because literally her feet, after 90 years, had never been worked on. So they were pretty sore, pretty tender. What showed up in her case, again, the brain area, okay, uh, pituitary, almost would have her come off, which is right in the middle of the big toe. Literally, she felt like it was a pin being driven through her foot. Makes a lot of sense because the pituitary has an awful lot to do with the thyroid. All right, so we also checked her thyroid um, reflex zone, which is at the bottom of the big toe, and it hurt extensively. Her adrenals, because of long-term stress, were out. Of course, her liver wasn't happy, her colon wasn't happy, and of course, her spine, as we worked down bilateral on both feet, her spine was incredibly, the spine zones were incredibly painful. So it's like, okay, we know what to do. So again, she, she literally would pay for four appointments at a time. We gave a discount. If you buy four appointments, you know, you get a discount. So she literally bought months and months and months over and over again. So she came in once a week, once a week for months. All right, and because we gave such a discount on her income, it was she was able to do this. And over the weeks, just like the previous patient, the pain got less and less and less. Well, I pushed harder and harder and harder, and yet the pain got better and better. And uh, her back pain diminished a significant amount. 
to where she didn't need a lot of painkiller drugs anymore because we worked on the spine areas, worked on the upper back muscles, like on the bottom of the back of the top of the feet, um, worked on the thyroid. So it got to where her hands and feet started getting nice and toasty again, you know, from the thyroid beginning to work. It got to where the pituitary zone didn't hurt at all anymore. Literally, I would press that thing and it didn't hurt her at all. So it showed all that was improving. So the, one of the big effects, it's nice to see the lack of the pain going down. It was nice to see some mobility returning to her. But as I mentioned in the previous episode, <laughs> the one thing that came out is that she got mean and crotchety, okay? But she always used to be mean and crotchety. What happened was is her brain was now functioning so she could fire back those insults very quickly. Before the, the, the family noticed that, she wasn't responding well. She couldn't think clearly. She got frustrated because she couldn't remember names. Well, she got back to where she could remember things, and her old self came out. And While it was mean and crotchety, people were happy to see that her brain was beginning to function again, and that was just her. That was just her personality. <coughs> but they were happy to see it. <coughs> One thing I want to point out, because it was a big issue with her, it was another big issue with the schizophrenic patient prior to her, Reflexologists are taught that, and this is so important, reflexologists are taught that when a reflexology is done, a reflexology session is done, I tell patients and I really emphasize it. <coughs> I go, make sure when you walk out of my office that for the rest of the day, you drink a lot of water. Drink a lot of water. Because even though I'm not on your colon, I'm really hitting your colon down here. Because I didn't hit your kidneys up here, I hit them down here. What reflexology does is it's kind of like a little circuit. I'm closing a circuit and I'm, and I'm hitting a nerve, for example, the kidneys. And that literally sends a signal to the kidneys and it stimulates them and gets them to working. And over time, this can cause a balance to occur within the kidneys and the colon and the liver. <laughs> and if you don't drink a lot of water, you can get sick because those toxins get re-released. The kidneys and the colon, everything starts to work again. And they're going, I need something to get rid of this, this toxins that you have so wonderfully re-released again. The patient that I mentioned before just now about the, uh, the schizophrenia, he was a wonderful example of this. I treated him on Thursday. I mean, on a Wednesday afternoon, Friday, he was able, we allowed him to call me at home because we wanted to make sure he was doing fine. Friday, he called me and he said, Doc, when you did that reflexology to me on Wednesday, he said, Thursday, I got sick as a dog. He said, I got so sick. And I said, ah, you didn't drink enough water, did you? And he said, apparently not, because when I started drinking water, it all went away. <laughs> so this, people think that it takes deep tissue massage and it takes other types of manipulative type modalities to start breaking those toxins up. And I can tell you, reflexology does an excellent job at detoxing, at breaking them up. So be aware with your clients, with your patients, <coughs> that you make sure that when you are done with a session that they are educated each and every time, because you have to remind them every time that they are to drink plenty of fluids because this is a good thing but if they drink fluids, they very likely will not feel the effects of the detox. It's a good thing. And eventually they won't have a whole lot left to detox. All right. So that was that patient with that. Uh, let's see. We had another patient that uh, came in with multiple sclerosis. Okay. Again, I talked about her, 33-year-old patient presenting MS. Her MRI showed the standard lesions in her brain. I think she had three lesions, right? Pretty much where we'd expect them to be. She came in 33 years old on a cane with uh, vision beginning to be affected. Swallowing was beginning to be affected. She had to live at home with her parents. She'd never moved out. <coughs> came in, we have a very set protocol that we do for autoimmune type disorders. All right, started on that. Started, we also did reflexology. And reflexology with MS, remember a significant part of this is nerve damage, but it's also immune system. So again, worked on the brain center, okay, worked on the pituitary hypothalamus, we worked on the um, pineal gland. <clears throat> we also worked significantly, which is kind of, it's on the, 
kind of on the ball of the foot, on the uh, left, let me see on the, uh, let me see on the left foot there. Uh, you have to, no, on the right foot, excuse me, on the right foot. I have to look backwards with the patients. On the right foot is their thymus gland. Work on the thymus gland. The most doctors will look at autoimmune as the immune system is going crazy. All right. Okay, so we must subdue it. We must subdue, we must put them on prednisone and immuran, we must put them on immunosuppressants. Okay, but what are the main side effects to immunosuppressants? You're now open to pretty much every little bug and fungus and virus that comes down the pike. All right, and you'll see these commercials where half of the commercial is, be aware now that you can die from a fungal infection and from this and this, and make sure you tell your doctor that you've been exposed because you can die now from their immunosuppressants. We don't look, in holistic medicine, we don't look at, it, at autoimmune diseases as an immune system going crazy. We have a very different look at it, outlook at it, and it works for what we do. And that is, if my hand is a cell in your body, on the surface of every cell in your body is a little flag. It's a little protein marker, but it's a little flag to the immune system saying, it's me, don't eat me. In other words, I'm part of you, don't eat me. Okay, what happens is just about every human on earth has some genetic propensity to something, some body system weaker than others. For example, all autoimmune is really the same thing. In type 1 diabetes, it's the beta cells on your pancreas, right? When you've lost 80% of those through the immune destroying them, the immune system destroying them, you now have type 1 diabetes, you can't make insulin really anymore. Okay. Same with MS, it's the sheathing on the muscle, on the nerves. Uh, myosinia gravis is the muscle receptors on the nerves on the muscles, it's just, they're all different, but they all have the same thing. That flag, you, because it's a genetic weakness in your body, if you do not have a healthy lifestyle, then that is gonna be the one place in your body that does not do as well at getting rid of toxins and viruses and bacteria and fungus and stuff. So it's gonna be the one more likely to have damage. Okay, so in the case, so that, so those cells grow, but they grow without that flag or a damaged flag. It might be a relatively healthy cell, <coughs> to me, but because that flag is missing, <coughs> the immune system goes, that's not me. And the immune system's job is to take out cells that are non-self. All right, so the immune system's working fine. It's doing its job. It just doesn't realize that that really was self, <coughs> but you've made a damaged cell. It doesn't recognize it. So from a holistic point of view, it's our job to get you to where you start regrowing cells with happy little flags on them again. And the immune system goes, cool beans, I'm not going to take you out. It's, it's all good. All right. So in the case of in her case, it was the sheathing on the, uh, the nerves and things of that nature. All right. So we worked on the thymus gland, started working on that, saying, all right, you need to do your job, but you need to calm down while still staying strong. It's not an immunosuppressant therapy. It's saying, calm down, be strong. All right, so what that does is it minimizes the damage while we wait for the rest of the treatments to take effect. All right, so we worked on our thymus, we worked on the brain centers. Uh, again, almost without fail, it would be adrenals, and very often it's kidneys, things of that nature. And uh, we started <laughs> working on her reflexes just in general for motor control. In three weeks, she was off her cane, right? It took a year of treatments overall because this is a very serious issue. But in three weeks when she was off her cane, within two months, her eyes and her throat had completely cleared up as far as the effects from MS. And as I mentioned before, in a year, she had moved out of her family's house for the first time in her life, now 34 years old at that time. She was holding down a job. And as I mentioned before, she was doing something I did not approve of, but I was happy for her she could wear high heel shoes. <laughs> okay, so, well, from a holistic point of view, they're terrible things to wear. It was wonderful that she had the balance and the capability to be able to do it. So I was happy for her that she was able to do that. All right, so I, that's another example of how reflexology can play a major component because remember, we're stimulating nerves that go to specific body systems. We're basically telling that part of the body, let's wake back up. Because in MS, what often happens, and this is where reflexology has a great tool in any neuromuscular disease. By the time you get them as clients or patients, they've already had this disorder very likely for decades. What that causes is 
those body systems that were affected, they become atrophied because they don't use them as much. For example, the eyes become atrophied. The swallowing reflexes become atrophied. The, the leg muscles become atrophied because either they're in a cane or they're in a brace or they're in a wheelchair. What, one of the things that reflexology does is we hit those points on the feet, goes, wakes up those nerves, wakes up those body systems to go, kind of like tapping and saying, it's time to wake up. Let's start working again. So for years or decades, those body systems have had no stimulation whatsoever. We now are helping to activate those. Um, and even in lieu of physical therapy, getting them moving, this actually does do some of that type of stimulation. It begins to wake them up. And all of a sudden, the patient begins to notice, I'm able to swallow better because we're, we're, we're working on the throat, like when we work around the big toe. We're working on the foot, on the throat. So those muscles, even though we don't ever reach up here and touch them with physically, we're actually activating them and stimulating down on the feet or on the hands or on the ears, types of things like that. And so in neuromuscular disorders, it's a wonderful therapy because we're beginning to wake them up. So while we're waiting for the rest of the protocols to kick in, they're beginning to wake up. It's an it's a awesome thing to see happening. All right. Uh, another patient that uh, I can talk about here real quick. Uh, this patient, she was a CNA at one time, and she made a big boo-boo. She did something she was not supposed to do. As a CNA, you learn when you're working with very large patients, you're supposed to put a belt on them to help lift them and move them around. She did not do that on this one occasion. And so the patient fell and she tried to protect the patient and ended up damaging her back. So she ended up getting a work comp award headed for disability because the back was so damaged. She'd been going to a chiropractor, you know, uh, insurance was paying for therapy, nothing was working. We met her through my, my doing a series of lectures. And in the lectures, um, we would have, I would have different topics. Well, she heard about us and her and her husband started coming to the lectures. And it was a habit of hers to lay on the floor during the lecture. She asked if it was okay and we told her fine. She'd be off in a corner somewhere laying on the floor because she couldn't sit in a chair. She could not do it. The pain was so great. Uh, eventually she became a patient with the clinic and she was a regular physical therapy patient with us we worked on her feet extensively every week this went on month after month after month working on the the hip reflexes working on the spine reflexes working on the back upper back muscle reflexes again on the top of the foot because even though those weren't damaged there was an actual physical damage at the lumbar area we did an MRI and there was true physical damage down there. But whenever your back gets hurt, you tend to compensate or overcompensate with one side of the body or in the upper part. So you end up initially hurting down here and eventually damaging the whole back through overcompensation. It's kind of like I tell patients, if you hurt your left knee, you're going to favor it by walking on your right. But if you never fix the left knee, eventually the right will now become damaged from overuse. And so that's what happened. So we started working extensively, the reflexology, for example, working extensively on the upper back muscles, working, working on the hip. And when we first started working on her hip reflexes, it was extremely painful, very, very painful for her. Again, like all these patients, as the appointments continued on, as the sessions continued, the pain got less and less and less. All of a sudden, she was sitting in chairs. All of a sudden, she was walking around. She didn't need help from her husband anymore. She was able to move around, and she had freedom of movement. And it was just a blessing to see that these things can happen. So when you're doing reflexology on a patient, make sure that you keep in mind the body systems that are also being affected by the primary damaged one. For example, her hips were damaged but we knew that it affected other zones because of how you carry yourself. So always be aware that just because this part may be damaged, you want to support the others as well that don't appear to be as bad, but they are being damaged in concert or referral. Um, so that's why every time we do reflexology, even though we know it's only the eyes that are bad, we do the entire foot every time, you know, bilateral, both feet, 
while focusing extensively on the eyes, always keep the entire body in balance. And it works a lot better that way. All right, I'm trying to think what else I'd want to cover here. Um, but those are the main uh, patients, just example. Okay, so uh, again, always, okay, always be aware, make sure your patients stay hydrated, always focus holistically on the whole foot, on the whole body. Learn what parts of the bad parts, work on those extensively, but never ignore all the other body parts. And always feel free that the patient can encourage them to work with all sorts of modalities, that reflexology is one of many, and it works, especially in chronic issues, it works much better when it's used in concert with others. And the world is coming around. The world is beginning to see that, oh, this is a valid form of therapy, and it works very well. All right. Okay, I think we're in chat mode, right? I think anybody that needs to ask anything can. Okay, all righty, um, so. I go, please, ask go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, you just said encourage them to work with other modalities. Are there particular modalities that you um, encourage more? I mean, obviously, it would, maybe it would depend on what the particular uh, client, uh, what their health issue is, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay, in other words, what kind of modalities I would recommend as well as reflexology? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Okay, okay, great example. In the earlier part of this particular episode, I, I talked for about five minutes about what, the, what our clinic, the Tree of Life Holistic Wellness Center does. We are the only naturopathic primary medical center in Northern California. You pretty much name it, we treat. We do holistic medicine with herbs. We do vitamin and mineral therapy. We do nutrition counseling. Uh, we do reflexology. We do uh, a, a large number of different types of modalities. When it comes, the main, while we treat anything at our clinic, our main focus is on long-term chronic issues, uh, autoimmune, cancer, Lyme, uh, Crohn's disease, you pretty much name it cro chronic, we treat it. Okay, we have found with reflexology, as I mentioned just a moment ago, Reflexology can be used by itself very well, especially in acute situations. They come in with a cold or a flu and they just need some strengthening of the immune system and they don't want to take anything. Reflexology actually works very, very well for minor acute situations by itself. Like other modalities, I don't care whether you're talking about pharmaceuticals, you're talking about holistic medicines or diet. All these modalities work best when used in conjunction with others because they all support each other. So for example, our patients with reflexology, okay, they work, what works wonderful with reflexology that I find in my own particular practice is nutrition therapy, lifestyle recommendations uh, in holistic medicines such as herbs and vitamin and mineral therapy. Um, so it, it works extremely well. And we have found in, in cases to where we did the holistic medicines and we did the nutrition, and they all carried the patient a good way. When reflexology was brought in, it just took it there to that place much faster. It make, because again, we're stimulating those zones to heal. We're waking them up. So I hope I'm answering your question that while we do just about anything at the clinic, my two favorite modalities to use in conjunction with reflexology is holistic medicines um, and, and nutrition. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Um, oh, no worries. And I have one other question, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, no, of course not. I have clients that often want to know how long before I'm going to be able to see results. And, uh, you know, I have different answers to that. Um, but I'm curious, what, what do you say? <laughs> I have a wonderful answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in medical practice now almost 19 years. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the most common questions I get asked because mm -hmm. people come in fearful. They come in in pain. They're scared. They, they're frustrated because they've been to one healthcare provider after another and they're frustrated that they heard about you or you're their last ditch effort uh, on and on. And so they they want an answer to that question. I'm going to give you two common answers I gave. These were two doctors in my medical schools that I went to that gave this. One was Dr. Christopher, very world-famous naturopathic doctor, famous herbalist, world-famous. 
he said that was one of the most common questions he used to get asked. I'm going to give you his answer, and then I'm going to give you another doctor who was in one of the med schools I was in, and I'm going to give you his answer next. Dr. Christopher used to say, look, it took you years to get here. It's going to take you time to get through this. It's going to take time to heal. And so for some patients, that's enough of an answer, but they don't know what time means. What do you mean by it took me years? Is it going to take me years, or is it going to take me weeks or months? Okay. That answer is highly re reliant on two big things. One, what is the condition and how long I've had it? That's one. For example, cancer. My average cancer program at the clinic is nine months to a year because we don't believe in remission. We believe in the patient finding a cure. All right. Uh, but again, cancer is what cancer is. Lyme is, I actually heard another doctor say this and he was right. Lyme is harder to cure than cancer is. And our average Lyme program is nine months to a year. I tell them that. But, so, but there are other things. I've seen Crohn's disease clear up in 60 to 90 days. Okay, because then it's the second stipulation that matters. How dedicated is the patient willing to follow the program? Dr. Christopher said something else, and then I'll tell you about the other doctor. Dr. Christopher said there are going to be three types of patients, three types of clients that you're going to find in your, in your practice, in your career, that are not going to be cured. There's going to be three types that will not find a cure. One is, and the, I've had all three of these, and they, this one is my hardest. It's their time to go. They're tired. They just don't want to do it anymore. They just don't want, they just, they just want to rest. And that's a hard one to deal with. Because you go, I know you can be, inside you're going, I know you can be cured if you'll just fight a little longer. And there are just some people that they're just tired and you have to accept that and take it as part of your practice and your treatment with them is to make them comfortable. It's hard, but I've been there. The second one, that's you will never find a cure. You, they will, the patient or the client will never find a cure. <laughs> and I've had a few of these, are hypochondriacs. They find that negative attention is better than no attention, that there is something missing in their lives emotionally, psychologically, that if they found a cure, then they would be missing some kind of attention or they feel that they would not be getting that attention anymore. And so you will find that hypochondriacs will constantly sabotage their, their, their treatments, okay, their care. And the third kind, and this is the one that I see the most, they just won't follow the program. <laughs> they just won't follow your advice. And I don't care whether you're an MD, an ND, a reflexologist, a chiropractor, uh, a dietitian. We all experience patients or clients who come in and they want a magic bullet. They want to be cured of something that they, in most, in many cases, brought about on their own and they want to cure now. And so when you tell them, I'm sorry, this is going to take time and most won't follow it. All right, so the second answer to your question about how long, how do you answer this? And this was a wonderful answer from a, from a doctor in med school, taught us, and he said this. He said, look at it this way, for any chronic long-term condition, because acute, again, boo-boo toes and colds and flus, they can be over them in a week or two or more, or even a month at worst. But chronic, which means this has been a long-term thing long before they came into your picture. He said, look at it, tell your patients or your clients this. For every year you have had this chronic condition, for every year that you've had this chronic condition, it is going to be a month of hard work. Okay, hard work, which means the patient has to take charge. They have to take part in, in the responsibility in their own cure. They have to follow the advice. They have to follow the protocols. They have to follow up with what you ask them to do at home, you know, as we covered earlier in this session today. So a great example is, very common, a patient comes in and they've had this chronic condition for 12 years. Well, if it's a month for every year, I literally tell the, the patients or the clients, I go, you're looking at a year of hard work. You've had this for 12 years. You're looking at a hard year. You're looking at a year of hard work to get over this. Now, what I do to follow up with that, though, because that can be disheartening. You mean I've got to spend the next year of my life 
Or if I've had this problem for six years, I'm looking at six months of hard work. Okay, that can be disheartening, even though you go, look, this is such a small time in your life. I tell cancer patients, my goal is, my, my hope is, that a year from now, you're going to say, I used to have cancer, which would be a wonderful thing to say. What's a year? Or what's six months? Or three months? But to help them have hope, besides giving them case histories, is you say, okay, you've had this thing for 12 years. It's going to take you a year to get over. It may take a year for us to say you're done. In our clinic, we like to say you've graduated. <laughs> you're leaving. You've graduated from the program. Go away. <laughs> you don't need to pay doctor, pay us anymore, or, or pay your health care provider anymore if you're cured. Okay. What we tell them to give them hope also is that while it might be a year from now, depending on how long you've had this condition, you can start seeing improvement relatively quickly. For example, the, the young lady with MS, she was a year of treatments, but she was off her cane in three weeks. Now, was she still wobbly for months after that and she still had motor control issues? Yes. But let them know that if they follow your advice and they do what they're supposed to do, there is a pretty good likelihood that while this might take a long time, they can start seeing results relatively quickly. It's hard for me to remember a patient who as long as they followed the program, they, they didn't see results within 30 days. Every patient I can think of of over 19, almost 19 years, if they followed my advice, they saw results by their next appointment. Okay. Other than reflexology types things, we generally ask patients to come back once a month. Reflexology is once a week for about a month or two or so, depending. But most patients that aren't doing reflexology, we say we like to see you once a month. Almost invariably, by the next appointment, they, are, they come back and go, I can feel some differences. I can feel some changes. Now, throw reflexology into that, and the changes can happen even faster. So... I tell them that, you know, the year thing versus a month. I tell them the, but I also let them know, follow the advice. You know, keep doing it at home, follow up at home. Even though it might take a long time, they can see results in a very short period of time. And that encourages them to continue the program. Like, oh, this works. This helps. And they'll keep going after that. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, just to clarify, you said you do reflexology once a week. And um, so, in, for example, for the person that we're saying approximately a year, it would be once a week for a year, approximately? Oh, no, no, no. no great okay. question. Great question. Reflexology can be very, very effective. Um, so our general rule of thumb is, especially on chronic issues, and again, we always, as I mentioned earlier, we always try to be aware that while more and more insurance companies are starting to cover reflexology, most patients don't have those kinds of insurance yet. So I have to be aware that, you know, these people are paying out of their pocket. And while I need to value my, my expertise and skill, I also have to be sensitive that I want them to get the care and not go broke doing it. So we offer patients actually, for example, group packages. You buy, you buy, four uh, sessions at a time, you get a discount in each session. So patients will usually buy, very often will buy four sessions at a time, so that's a month. My general recommendation is, and we get this question a lot, like I had a patient in yesterday and she did very well and she left out there just as happy as could be. And her first question out of her mouth was, how often should I come back? Okay, and I go, that is, we wanna take finances into account and we'll try to help you out where we can. But in the beginning of any reflexology appointment uh, uh, protocol that is involving chronic issues, we generally say once a week in the beginning. We usually do that for about a month to two, month, month to month and a half. If the patient's making very good progress, then we say, okay, let's stretch that out to every two to three to four weeks. And we stretch it out so that after maybe two, three months, we're getting further and further out. In the beginning, the first month, pretty much I agree with what we were taught in school as well once a week for at least the first month. And it also helps if they're following up at home, you know, doing things at home, stretching and things of that nature. So most patients end up not doing reflexology for a whole year because 
After about a month, they're feeling so good, we're stretching it out, we're stretching it out until generally the longest I've ever had a reflexology patient doing reflexology as part of the protocol is usually only about three, four months. Okay, because by then, they're healing enough to where they, and I do, I still have patients to this day that will come in every once or twice every six months as a maintenance, as a follow-up by that point. And, and they'll come in, yeah, exactly. And they'll come in and they'll go, oh, that little place is hurting again a little bit. And I'll go, right, okay, so we'll work on it. And we might work on them for a couple weeks and they're pretty much back to where they were. What that tells you is when you, get, when you help them get balanced, they then go home <laughs> and they don't come in for months and they come back and they're going, you know, that's hurting a little bit. And so then the first thing out of your mouth is, what have you been doing? Well, I went back to eating this again, or I quit doing my stretches, or blah, blah, blah. You know, one big question I get is, especially from cancer patients and Lyme patients, if I go through all this, will I ever have cancer again? <laughs> will I ever have Lyme again, or this kind of thing? And I go, you will get cancer again if you go back to your old habits. You will, okay, because most people, again, most humans have a propensity. Like some families have a long history of colon cancer. Other families have a long history of breast cancer. All right. What cancer is what it is, and it is significantly caused. I say it's different within children, but in adults, cancer is a disease of lifestyle and emotions and spirit and things of that nature. If you... If I treat you for cancer and we're blessed and your cancer goes away, if you go right back to Big Macs and Burger King and McDonald's and pizzas and French fries, yes, one day it might come back. So the good news is that uh, most patients that we have pretty much stay in a good lifestyle and I never get them back for the same disorder. So we're happy to hear about that. All right. Great. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. So I think we're about at our, uh, at, at our time limit. All right. So again, I, I appreciate everybody coming in and I look forward to any feedback as far as is, was this helpful to you? Please don't hesitate to let us know. Again, this was sponsored by the Reflexology Association of California. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Spindalelis and our next uh, the third in the series is June 1st, and that will be reflexology in cancer patients. We will be focusing that hour primarily on how reflexology can be used as a wonderful, wonderful modality within the cancer arena and the precautions you need to be aware of in, in the treatment thereof. But it is a wonderful modality, even when used in concert with conventional or complementary medicine. All right. All right. Well, I've enjoyed speaking to all of you and everybody have a wonderful Memorial weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.